Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to wait for our wonderful guests to join us, which might be two seconds, hopefully. All right, we've just got Sam coming in soon. Great. All right, good morning and welcome everyone. Um, I hope you've all got a coffee or a tea at the ready. Some of you are probably still sitting in your PJs, which is half your luck. I um, ironed a shirt for the first time in 10 weeks this morning. So um, I'm back in work mode, even though I'm stuck in my, um, my house. Yeah. Um, and if you're really lucky, you've probably got some kids next door screaming around. Um, mine's at school today. So for the sake of this webinar, that's probably a good thing. Um, and I guess that's a welcome to the new norm that we've all got going on. Um, what a year 2020 has turned out to be. I definitely didn't anticipate it when I jumped on a plane to Japan back in February this year. Um, I suppose before we get started, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Renee Lamel, um, Head of Marketing and Sales here at Bonfire. I've had the pleasure of being a part of the furniture of Bonfire for over 15 years, um, which is a pretty healthy stint, uh, and been in the marketing game for 25, so that probably gives you an in indication of my vintage. Um, and on, on the off chance that you don't know who Bonfire is, uh, Bonfire is uh, one of Australia's leading digital performance agencies. Um, we work with brands from SMBs through to enterprise level clients, um, helping them adapt and grow, or as the case is at the moment, recover um, through our specialty areas in search and social marketing. If you didn't know that, I might need to lift my marketing game just a little bit, but um, you're all here on the webinar, so we're doing something right. Um, jokes aside, with isolation being the new black, um, we decided to launch a webinar series because it's pretty hard to get into a room with people these days. Uh, and the idea behind the series is not to provide everyone with strategic best practice and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's plenty of that content out on the web at the moment. But rather what we wanted to do was actually bring some leading WA marketers in for a chat. Um, the people that are actually out there doing the do uh, and, you know, testing and trying things and seeing what's working, what's not working. Um, the people in the trenches, as I like to call them. So um, today I'm really chuffed to have two of WA's finest in our presence um, in Sam and Claire. But before I get into all their intros and their bios and all that sort of stuff, I just want to do a bit of housekeeping just so we know how today's going to run. Uh, I know we're all Zoom gurus. I've had more Zoom meetings in the last two months than I've had in my entire life. Um, but that said, if you have got any technical difficulties during today, um, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and Hayley and Sasha will try and solve it for you. Uh, you've also probably noted that you're all muted and your video is switched off. Um, uh, as much as I would love to have you all providing live feedback and comments and questions, the idea of 200 marketers all talking at the same time was a little bit more that I could handle on a Tuesday morning. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to take questions and answers through the Q&A section down the bottom. Um, and what we'll do, time permitting, is we'll come to those at the end um, and see what we can answer. Um, so, <clears throat> without further ado, our guests. Um, today we've got Sam, oh, Samantha Campbell joining us. Um, Sam is the Manager of Brand, Marketing and Digital at CCIWA, which I think is the longest title going around at the moment. Pretty much, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Sam's worked both sides of the agency and client spectrum, if you will. Um, with stints at um, the Betts Group, Bankwest, Landgate, Longtail, Braintails, and probably quite a few in between, um, with a career that spanned over two decades, which makes Sam in similar vintage to myself, give or take. We won't get into details. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, she's established herself as um, one of her leading strategic marketers with a real penchant for digital. And alongside Sam, we've got uh, Claire McElhaney, who's the Head of Marketing Projects at St. John WA, a much more concise title, I know. Um, Claire began her career with a family favourite at Cadbury's way back, way back when, and again has been in the game for about as long as Sam and myself. Um, worked with several Fortune 
several Fortune 500 companies over the years. More recently, founded a publishing business, which has released 15 award-winning books, and all while continuing to provide strategic marketing advice to Australian businesses. Um, and then was very fortunate to join St. John WA in January this year, just before COVID-19 unleashed itself on the world. So um, a baptism of fire, I would suggest. Um, so to say that both overachievers is probably quite an understatement. So hi, Sam. Hi, Claire. How are we both? Hi. That's good. Um, I can see we're both working from our very professional home offices this morning. Um, Sam's got a very fancy little shoe in the background going on. Is that, where's your home office today? Are you in the kitchen? No, I'm in my dining room slash kitchen. Yep, kind of place. Best lighting in here. It's all about the lighting, Renee. Absolutely. That's, yep. you know, our professional webinar setups. <laughs> And where, where do we find you this morning, Claire? Have you got a dedicated space going on at the moment? Yeah, I, I do. It's a, uh, it's a non-negotiable in any house that we live. I have to have a studio. Oh, fantastic. Well, good for some. Good for some. It's a repurposed room. We've also got a library and that's only called that because it's got a few books in it, Renee. So. Well, I look, I just put a few books on the shelf in the back to look quite learned before this webinar. So um, I, I empathise. Um, we're going to cover a lot of content today about how you guys have both um, been navigating COVID-19 for your respective organisations, which are quite iconic WA brands. But I guess before we get into the, the nitty gritties of that piece, I'm really keen to hear how you have both handled um, the new normal. Uh, I'll try and avoid all these cliche terms as much as possible, but I'm a marketer, so there's a good chance I'll keep falling back into them. Um, yeah, how, how have you both dealt with, you know, the changes that have come into play, just from an individual point of view, like, you know, working from home and all the rest of it. And maybe I'll start with you, Sam. Okay. Um, I was actually like you, I didn't get to go on my trip earlier in the year. I was supposed to go on um, up to Spain just as the restrictions started to happen. So I decided to go on leave and kind of, you know, spend it at home and doing some bits and pieces. So I had that first three weeks of isolation at home, just being on holidays. And then when I came back to work, it was a bit of a struggle. The first couple of weeks were a bit of a struggle in terms of, you know, work Sam and home Sam. You're supposed to be at work and you're doing things, but mm. sitting around in your pajamas and you, you know, you're looking out your window, and it's it's been a bit of a, a bit of a challenge just trying to make sure you draw that line between what is happening at home and what's um, happening at work. So, um, but it only took a couple of weeks to kind of find my feet and. Um, yeah, it's been, other than that, it's been um, pretty, pretty easy to kind of get used to, I think. And, and how, like, how, are you, how are you trying to maintain that life balance? Because it is really easy to suddenly go, you know what, it's 7.30, I'll just wander into my office or dining room or wherever it is that you are, turn your laptop on, you're in your PJs, you've got yourself a, you know, a cup of coffee and off you go. And then before you know it, it's six o'clock at night and you know, yes, you've gone and done some washing and you've done this and that, but you've kind of not really switched off. So how are you actually putting some parameters in place? Yeah, um, I think that's what I was struggling with is that I would just be working constantly um, because yeah. as soon as you come out of my bedroom, there's my computer all set up on my dining table and off we go kind of thing. So I think it's important to just have, a. I mean, everyone says this, this is the cliche answer, right? Have a routine, make sure that you get up and you have the breakfast and you, get dressed and you do your hair and your makeup and you, you know, like you're going to work. And then I think at the end of the day, I, it's really important for me just to pack all of this down and close it all off so that I'm not looking at it and feeling guilty that I'm not sitting up here doing more work and things like that. So I think they're probably the two main things that kind of got me through that sort of stuff. Yeah, right. Good. And how about you, Claire? Like, how have you navigated it from an individual point of view? Yeah, look, it's been business as usual to a large degree because I'm used to working um, by myself when I need to sit down and do strategy or, just, or to articulate what has been discussed in previous meetings. It, it's more um, with the team and knowing that, I, as we were saying earlier, I've got such a high number of stakeholders and the team's meetings definitely seem to have increased versus a normal day people are perhaps 
jumping in and booking a team's meeting more quickly than or ringing you, which is wonderful because you're speaking to people, but by the same token, there is, a, I'm actually finding there's a lot more engagement with people by virtue of the isolation because they are sitting at home. They do want to have that people connection. So they'll just hit teams and you'll hear you. The first time it happened, it was, where's that coming from? <laughs> Looking at <laughs> <laughs> I've got it. I've got the app downloaded now, so I know where it's coming from. But um, so, from that point of view, I I haven't really noticed a lot of difference. It's a it's a matter of juggling between going into work because we have still been going into work. Um, yep. We've had our team staggered, or I've, I've had a couple working from home um, full time, but others have been wanting to come into the office. So there's been that balance of two days in, three days home, three days in, two days home. So I think the challenges have, have been simply in, as uh, Samantha was saying, in not working, in not overworking. So I'd find myself start working at 7am and my husband made a comment over the weekend to someone that, yeah, and then, then she'd emerge from her office at about 9pm. 9, 9 <laughs> and I'd ask her, is that all yet? And I'd say, oh, no, I've just got to do a few emails. And, uh, you know, I think we really do have to think about just because you're working from home, it doesn't mean that the the um, onus of trust and having to fulfil that trust is any more or less than it used to be. Your your organisations trust that you're doing the work that you need to do, and if you're doing more, then that would probably be a bit of an alarm bell for them. Yeah, well, and it is it, it is quite interesting, right? Because you know. Let's assume we're all very conscientious workers on this webinar. You do have that sense of if you are working from home, you that level of accountability on your own productivity where you tend to almost overcompensate for the work. And, you know, this, everyone talks about the, the benefits of this new arrangement where everyone's working remotely and you've got more time to spend with your kids and your husband or not, as is the case with you, Claire. But um, you, if you don't find the balance right, you actually don't end up taking advantage of what the positives could be out of these sort of situations. And that's, you know, that's a real challenge, I think, as professionals and individuals is to just fall into these like bad habits and traps and stuff. Um, just in terms of like individual professional um, motivations and insights, what, what are you turning to now? I mean, we're all working remotely, so we're probably absorbing a lot more media than we have in the past. So I'm curious to know where you're getting your information from now, like whether that's COVID-19 information or it's finding insights in terms of strategy or marketing? What, where are you guys leaning? Yeah, I, I um, have certainly noticed that I'm consuming, I can see Samantha smiling there. <laughs> uh, I've, I've certainly um, noticed I'm consuming even more research than usual because there are, uh, you know, you've got global WebEx and a number of other organisations that are churning out COVID related um, surveys, mainly in the UK and in America, but we also have commissioned our own short and sharp survey as well to see what consumer sentiment has been about St John and about the government and about um, COVID related issues in general. But I, I've also found myself, uh, Aaron Crowther, our um, director of, uh, what is it, brand communications, brand and communications, he, um, he actually set us all a challenge to listen to an audible book called uh, Just Be Nimble by Graham Winter. And that book actually gave me, so I listened to it while I was on my walks and I haven't really done much audible listening before. And, and that to me was kind of a refreshing break from the COVID related things and to take time and step back and revise my leadership attributes and where I needed to grow, where I needed to help my team grow and where we all sat within the community and we needed to have community growth as well. So I definitely recommend that book, Just Be Nimble by Graham Winter, an excellent listen. And, and it really talks yeah. to the nimbleness required now in times like COVID, even though they weren't dealing with COVID. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you're right. This, this overwhelming amount of information coming through us. I mean, it's, I think was it, I was talking to you, Sam, and you're talking about the, the Teledex, because you know, we're old enough to know what those old Teledexes are. <laughs> hey, um, for the young people in the audience. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, there's like this, you're just engulfed with information at the moment. So it is really hard to, to kind of filter through it. And so, you know, it's, it's good when people share, whether it's an audio book or it's, you know, global web index that you mentioned, Claire, is actually a really great little reference. Like get an email from them every couple of days as well. And it's a really nice little sentiment report about what's going on and how people's consumer behaviours are changing and stuff. Um, what, are you, what are you leaning on at the moment, Sam? Like where are your... Uh, very similar to what Claire has done, we've, we've put out, I mean, it's our job to listen and react to our members and what's happening. So we've been very proactive in making sure we, you know, are in, in contact with them quite regularly and looking for their feedback and stuff. Um, so our chief economist has a, a weekly webinar that he's been putting out, which is kind of, you know, keeping an eye on the, the economic kind of situation here in WA. Um, and off the back of that, we've been asking people to kind of give us their thoughts and things like that. But underpinning, that underpins our usual, our business as usual stuff. So we have business confidence that goes out every quarter and then we have a consumer confidence mm -hmm. survey that goes out every quarter. So that's, for us, that's business as usual, keeping an eye on what's happening and COVID is just the latest flavour of all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but in terms of marketing, um, I fell into the guilt trap that you were just talking about earlier in terms of I'm at home, therefore I've got to be doing things right I've got to be doing yep. all the things all the time um, so I signed up for the Adma um, masterclass the 12-week masterclass with really. and Mark Ritson mm. and so I've been doing that every week kind of you know putting some time aside and just touching base on all of that strategic stuff which is important and you know but you forget about in the busyness of every day so it's been it's been quite timely for me to kind of touch base into that sort of thing um, and then, yeah, Audible, um, Claire, Audible has been life-changing for me in the last 12 months. I have a book on the go, lots of, lots of books that I probably wouldn't pick up and read, but I'm quite happy to listen to while I'm on the bus or wandering around in the streets and things like that. So, yeah, all of that is still relevant and, and applicable, I think. Yeah. Um, you're not supposed to be wandering around on the streets, Sam, just... <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> we'll just keep moving. Um, that's right. Yeah, look, yeah, um, we, we're pretty lucky within Bonfire because we, um, we operate using Slack and so we've got this COVID-19 channel and, you know, marketing news channels. So we're disseminating that information between the team through those. So it, it kind of helps you filter because the way we do it is the staff find something and rather than just 5,000 posts going into it um we try and you know play ceo set up a what's your top three takeaways so you can kind of do a bit of a skim and that kind of helps you digest a lot of information really quickly which has kind of worked out really well for us um and just i just want to move on we we touched on how teams are operating at the moment how, how are your respective teams working with the the, the new situation i mean the, it's a lot more than just setting up a home office right there's there's real challenges around productivity and motivation and that sort of stuff. So I'm, I'm curious to hear how you both handled that. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the physical doing of work, um, we were fairly digital in our approach anyway. We mm. have Asana and we, have, we use Teams and, you know, a lot of our work is done remotely kind of, you know, necessarily, I mean, we have meetings, but, you know, a lot of the stuff's kind of done away from everybody else. So the challenges of, you know, communication and clarity and things like that are still a big challenge. It's just um, you have to work a little harder to kind of dig into it. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of motivation, I think because just because I'm trying to be gentle with myself here because I had a couple of weeks where I was kind of stumbling and trying to figure it out for myself. Team motivation and, you know, maintaining culture and things like that, I haven't really given a lot of thought to. I've just been trying to get through the day and make sure that, I'm projecting a positive outcome and I'm, you know, being, you know, as helpful as I possibly can. Um, we've changed some of the ways that we do our meetings. So a lot of our meetings, while there are, there are more of them, they tend to be quite short and sharp and to the point. So you get in, you do the thing you need to do and you get out. Um, uh, what else have we done? Um, but the senior leadership team at, at CCI have done a great job and the people team have done a great job of keeping us together. Last week we had a, um, a virtual quiz on Friday at five o'clock and we all got drinks delivered and, you know, cold vouchers to buy snacks. And then we all had the yep. quiz and it was, it was good fun just, you know, doing that sort of stuff remotely. Um, so 
so certainly for me, what now that I've kind of found my feet, I think, you know, finding a few of those things to kind of do with my team will be um, important moving forward. Yeah, right. Well. And how about yourself, Beth? It, as I mentioned before, with so many stakeholders, we've really had to pull together quickly and cross collaborate um, a lot more than ever before. You know, we, I know that we'll get to it, but we've had a lot of strategic marketing initiatives and product initiatives that we've pulled forward and created a lot more doing this and um, strategic direction than ever before. And I think one of the things that I've been fortunate with is that Aaron Crowther has been very clear in the direction of the team to, to sort of help that stability and from Michelle Fife as well to bring that stability down through the organisation so that we have little hooks, if you like, that we can feed out to the team. So a couple of them are, um, there's no such thing on stepping on each other's toes when we're dancing. And we've really been doing the pop rather than you know, as we've been dancing around things. And a lot of demands in, um, on the organisation to act quickly, but also to act thoughtfully and, and carefully and be fully cognizant of the potential outcomes that may or may not happen. And one of the examples is our digital first aid response, where people obviously can't do you know, face-to-face -face first aid anymore because that involves touching another person in terms of the training. Yeah. And we have a product, a, a digital interactive product, which was sitting there nearly ready to go. The only thing that was missing was the marketing and the launch and a few little technical bits. So in terms of um, a lot of people dancing in order to make that happen and a lot of frustrations and you throw in a little bit of COVID into the, into the cake mix and, and you realise that you've got something that can quickly bubble up over, you know, you've got too much butter in the mix and, um, you know, you, you look in the oven and all of a sudden it's doing what it's not meant to be doing. So I think by having Aaron there and, um, you know, through Michelle, realising that whatever thinking we're falling out of here, whichever, you know, the thought leadership, I suppose, if we can reach for that in teams, it can stabilise when things do start to bubble a little bit too much. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, uh, you make a, a really good point. It's, it's really important for that clear communication from the top to filter down, right? Uh, <clears throat> I think most of our organisations are probably doing a pretty good job of being transparent and open with our teams respectively. But it's in times like this when there is uncertainty and you've got so many layers to organisations and, you know, we're 46 people agency, your organisations are hundreds if not thousands of people. Um, if there isn't a really clear way for that information to disseminate down and provide some clarity around where, where we're going and what we're doing and we acknowledge that times are tough but um, we've got a plan in place to get from A to B and the other side of this, whether that's six months or two years, we don't know yet. Um, I think that's really critical and I think, you know, we've, we've tried and hopefully we've done it quite well at Bonfire to have regular contact, you know, whether that's your CEO, Zoom session, you know, once a month or departmental team meetings to do that sort of thing. So hopefully everybody's got a fairly clear picture of what's going on. Mm. But I, I also think that the cultural piece is critical, right? It's, it's all business as usual and all the rest of it, but we, um, a big part of our, the joy of working for Bonfire is the culture that we've got. You can wander around the office and you go and have a yarn with somebody. We've got 2 p.m. Gardo time, which is when everyone heads off to the coffee room and has a bit of a chit chat about whatever. And those sort of things obviously don't happen anymore, right? I mean, well, they do, we're trying to create them virtually, but that's the challenge, I guess, for us as marketing leaders with teams is how do you maintain that sort of stuff? And, you know, Sam, you've mentioned um, you know, your quiz and your Friday drinks. Are you doing anything on a, a bit more of a regular basis to just to have a bit of a, a check-in with your team members from less about how you achieving and productivity and objectives and all that, and, but more about how do you feel? Where's your mental health at? Yeah. Um, are you feeling connected to the organisation? How are you guys doing that? Yeah, well, I think I think it all comes down to the team leaders or the managers of, of people. Um, I think Chris and the senior leadership team do a good job of kind of doing the formal pieces. And we've mm. definitely got um, our normal um, updates and things like that that we would have once a month. They're still happening. They're still virtual. Chris, you know, gets on and he, he talks fairly frankly and openly and there's lots of questions and answers and things like that. 
I think for me informally, I think it's just what I've found is that people are very, they, they don't like turning on their video. And when you're in a meeting and there's more than, you know, maybe four or five of you, something, you know, a lot of people turn their, their sound off. So I found often that I'm just talking into the void. And so yeah. I'm trying to make sure that I'm at least asking specific questions to people when I'm kind of to get a feel. And I take a cue from the voice. I take a cue from, you know, the way that they're kind of answering the question and, and whether they're defensive or not defensive or, you know, maybe sometimes being too chilled about something is a, a, a bit of concern as well. So, you know, I'm tending to, as soon as I hear that sort of stuff, I'll, I'll pick up the phone and I'll talk to them. Um, I try and make sure that they can see me at least. So hopefully that encourages them to, you know, give me a, give me a little glimpse into what's going on. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm doing it ad hoc. I haven't, I, like I said, I've, 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 have not necessarily got anything formal in place for my team and I'm kind of relying on the senior leadership team and what they're doing from an overall structure point of view at the moment to kind of bring it down. But I, I feel that keenly. I think I was thinking about this morning when we were, when we were um, having our morning catch up that, you know, we really do need to do something as a team and, you know, try and bring it all together. So that's something I'm thinking about now. Yeah. Right. And uh, have you guys got any cultural initiatives over at St. John WA Claire? Cultural is the right word, but you know. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're really fortunate that we do have such a strong um, cultural leadership team. We have um, Chris Blake who heads up our community um, area. We really give a lot of thought to how we engage with our staff, and we've got ten thousand staff made up of eight thousand volunteers and two thousand um, employees. So it is it is very big, and you know I noticed one of the questions in the prep work that you sent through was um, procedures and policies and so on, and and um, that often stems out of culture. You know you've got you've got your policy of this is what you do and this is what will happen if you don't do what we tell you to do. Um, yeah. These are the expectations and I've heard Aaron say a couple of times, these are my expectations of um, the leadership team or of people within the organisation. And there's been a lot of talk around just the, you know, the, the human expectations that make up our culture. So it's talking with respect. It's not having triangles. It's, um, it's continually encouraging collaboration between teams that that was happening before. And I think what COVID has done is it's made it even more important and we're needing to remind ourselves regularly that all of the things that we aspire to be as leaders or as managers or even as employees mm. during a time of um, apparent crisis, you, you really need to reach for those and be reminded of them. And I've got no problems whatsoever with anyone tapping me on the shoulder and saying, hey, you know, just be a bit kinder or, you know, in, 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 in a team's meeting, perhaps watch your tone. I think that's a really big thing that uh, my natural state of being is a state of excitement and, and <laughs> wanting, wanting to drive things in a high energy. And, yep. you know, you have to realise that, that, that our natural state of being can come across quite differently in a team's or a Zoom meeting, which can be good and it can be bad. And, and to Sam's point about the video, that's actually been a real, a real bugbear of mine that if you're talking to someone and all you can see is this blue thing flashing at you while they're speaking. <laughs> it's, it's almost like, I know you don't like looking at yourself on the video. I don't either. And I can promise you, honey, that in 10 years time, you're going to hate it even more. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so. yeah, but I, I get that and I understand it, but it's how do you, how do you dance around that and um, help people feel comfortable to drop the robe and you know, say, okay, this yep. is what we all want. Metaphorically speaking. Metaphorically, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Metaphorically. No, that's right. Everyone's <laughs> giving some as well. <laughs> um, just before we move on, obviously great news yesterday, five dot ball days, as I like to call it, you know, five days with zero transmission or new cases in WA. Um, you guys getting closer to more full time? I mean, I know you've been in the office a bit anyway, Claire. Um, what's the schedule looking like for returning on a, a more full time scale? Well, well, my team are pretty much back in the office now. And um, all but one of us was there yesterday and we had our team meeting, you know, we, we were apart. We're lucky that we have got lots of training rooms where we've got that space to spread out. 
and we also had a team meeting on Friday with the directorate where it was on teams, but um, my team pretty much were all in the room at the same time, apart from the part-timers who weren't working on Friday. So, so that was good, but th there is a bit of a change, Renee, and I don't know if Samantha's finding it as well, that th th there's definitely an appetite now to consider that if you know what your staff or your team are working on, and just like me, if they have the need to sit there and turn off the sound and just focus on getting a piece together, then I'm okay with that. I've got one, uh, two team members working from home today for no other reason that they need to catch up and uh, consolidate their thoughts. Yeah. And then we'll all be back in the office tomorrow. So we, at St John, um, well, we never really could work from home when you're a paramedic. You, you know, <laughs> uh, we, we had to put measures in place that protected them, that protected the community. And from an office point of view, I know other departments were on a roster system so that they felt comfortable with the space that was between each employee in the hubs. But from, mm. from my team point of view, um, I, I managed each situation on an anxiety level by anxiety level some were more anxious than others about coming in in the early days and others were not so anxious others had children at school who were concerned about their children bringing COVID-19 home yeah. and then not wanting to pass it on into workplace so we're pretty pretty not easy not easy going in a um in that sense of the word but I think we've just applied the human the human side of things listening to people's needs and making it, it needs to work for the organisation as well. Yeah. I think the, um, I think the uplift of the, the positive side of COVID-19 is it's actually forced us to do things um, that we probably have had ticking along in the background and we'll get to it when we get to it. Like, for example, using teams in a, in a more um, across organisation kind of view or looking at digital tools that you can use to collaborate with and things like that. I think it's kind of forced mm. us to kind of try them and realize oh gosh it's not that scary it's not that bad mm -hmm. um from our working situation we've got some teams in the office at the moment but they're mostly um our people and our support teams um and again they're spread out and the way that our building is structured there's not a lot of space we're all kind of crammed in um at the moment um and we're actually in the process of moving this year so we'll be going off to two different new locations um, around June and July. And so there's a little bit of reluctance to go back to the old building yeah, um, because <laughs> we weren't expecting to. We were kind of expecting that we'd be home until we needed to kind of go forward. So the people team put out a survey last week just to check back, touch base with people and find out, you know, how are they coping working from home? What would we need? Things like that. But I think what Claire's talking about is really clever. Um, how do we get how do we get the best out of the fact that we now know we can work from home and be productive and then what how do we work at the office and be productive i think there's some um, there's some benefits to kind of look at you know working around that sort of stuff and you know depending on what type of work you're doing then that's that dictates where you should work from i guess um, does that answer yeah, your question so it, yeah? yeah it just it's finding i guess it's finding that yeah, the, the right initiatives is the work to get the best outcomes out of your people, right? And everyone's different and every organisation's different. Like you say, if you're a paramedic, guess what? You have to go to work every day. It's just the way it is. So, so that'll be. Um, all right, I'm just conscious of time. We want to get into the marketing piece because that's kind of the, the big crux of why we're here and that's your specialty area. So um, let's talk about that, all right? It's from, from a marketer's perspective, um, I was going to use the expression, it's kind of like having the rug pulled from underneath you. But as I said, I returned from the trip to Japan and for the first two and a half weeks of being back felt like I had suddenly joined a risk management business and wasn't working for a digital marketing agency. Um, and so we've all been moving really quickly to uh, adapt and shift and reassess our strategy. So what, what um, rethinking of strategy or brand have you both been through uh, over the last, I don't know, eight weeks, give or take? I think it's um, for for me in marketing at St John, and, and you know we we do have this um, very complex business where we have our first responders, you know our paramedics. We have products, we have services such as first aid. We have events as well. Um, you know, you've, those people all of a sudden literally had the rug pulled out from them because there were no more events, and and now 
they're coming into recovery in terms of, well, the phone is, run, re, you know, ringing and people are anticipating and wanting to book so that they don't miss out when we start having events again. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, from, from a marketing perspective, the strategy didn't really change. If anything, the strategy became front, uh, front and centre, which is uh, making first aid and healthcare accessible for all Western Australians and for humanity. So we were really reminded, um, I suppose, the nature of our business. Now more than ever, getting uh, or building resilient communities, putting first aid into their hands is, is, is critical. That um, for my team, you know, that we've been doing a defib drive. So defibrillators, you all know that Greg Page from the Wiggles um, was miraculously brought back to life because of a defib. And, you know, my team got thinking, well, really, if we went into severe lockdown, ideally you would want a defib in every single person's home in Western Australia and you would also want them trained in first aid. So where it went from being a nice idea that uh, perhaps we have a percentage of people who are trained in first aid, what does community resilience really mean? when it comes to our health. And we've been having some really interesting discussions around that. So we haven't changed the strategy, but I, I think <laughs> we're lucky that we've, we've now got this captive audience where they're looking at their health. And um, they're so, it's not like uh, a holiday where you can't look at a holiday at the moment. You can only dream about one. You can't book one. For us, it's, uh, gee, what if, what if I do get COVID-like symptoms? What if my child falls out of a tree in the backyard and breaks their arm? What if a snake comes into the backyard? We are Western Australia, after all. And I don't know how to treat that. So our conversations have been, what's our strategy and what can we do to amplify during these times of COVID? And I mentioned before the um, digital first aid platform, which is, uh, to my knowledge, it's a world first. And it, it's actually a platform where you can go in and use your mouse and engage and interact with it. Now, before now, that was like a nice to have. It was a gaming approach to first aid. It was um, potentially attractive to people out in the mines that they wouldn't have to be. It's not um, nationally accredited, but it is St John accredited. But all of a sudden it was like, well, what if every employee, say at Bonfire, you've got 50 employees. What if every single one of you had first aid training for you know, half the price and less time than if I had to send them away for a whole day to do this training at, at much more expense. And then I do have them working from home and I feel confident at least if something happens during work hours. At, you know, so the, the question for us became um, an explosive one and we're now just rethinking not so much our strategy. It, it is the business as usual, but it's the delivery that we're rethinking. Do we have Uber style delivery of first aid kits? Do we, um, you know, how, how can we, how can we utilize what's happening in the broader market uh, to have a strategic advantage? But that's not in a commercial sense. That's in making St. John part of everyone's life. Everyone's life. Um, you're St. John, I'm St. John, we're St. John. It's how do we actually communicate that now to the community that they feel engaged with us after COVID the way that they're feeling more engaged with us now. I don't know if that's different for you, Samantha, but um, for me, it's, uh, it's front and centre and, whoa, here's the opportunities that we've, um, we've had and now those opportunities are more and more relevant than ever before. Yeah, yeah it's a similar thing for us. Our organisation built around... Um, responding to situations and you know helping our members kind of navigate how this kind of works and so without being flippant about the amount of work that we've done because we've all been working our butts off um, this is business as usual for us like these sorts of times are where we really do um, shine if you want to think about it from a brand point of view and so therefore our strategy wasn't anything different and again I'll come back to my point about we had again Claire you get yeah, a really clever way to kind of take something that was a nice to have and now all of a sudden it's the most important thing. I think that's really where we came in. We've been, we've been doing a lot of content marketing. We've been playing around with how landing pages work with campaigns and things like that. And then all of a sudden that was the delivery mechanism. That was the thing. And so the effort that kind of went into building that sort of stuff. Um, I guess our journey through COVID-19 has really, it's changed. Um, so it's different 
uh, it's still us. It's still that we are here for business and we're trying to help you deal with what you need to deal with. But in the early days, it was about planning and preparing. And then in the middle, it was really about responding and making sure that the government um, was listening to what our members were saying about, you know, fees and concerns and things like that, just making sure that we were getting the response that we needed. And now we're kind of coming out the back end. It's about, it's about recovery and it's about a message of hope and how do we kind of prepare and start moving forward. And that's all elements of our brand. So nothing's happened, nothing's changed about, you know, the stories that we're telling. It's just the, the situation that we're in that's kind of bringing it to life. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think we've had to kind of shuffle. And like I said, I, I don't mean to be flippant, flip it, but responding and reacting, it's just, it's just how we're built. That's exactly yeah. what we do. And so it's been business as usual for us, um, more or less. Yeah, and, and, and I guess in different ways, you both are offering fairly essential services, right? Um, obviously, St. John WA is a pretty obvious essential service. No, no, even no, out no doubt. <laughs> outside of the ambulance and the first aid training and stuff. But if even if we look at CCIWA and, you know, Sam, you and I were talking about this when we had a catch-up beforehand, it's this suite of services around policy and procedure and employee engagement and stuff has almost been a nice to have for some businesses, right? It's been maybe that, that piece in their organisation that they haven't had to worry about or haven't wanted to worry about. Right. And suddenly you have something like a crisis unleash itself on you and all of these businesses that are quite resource poor and don't have frameworks are suddenly grappling to deal with it and from a business point of view it becomes very essential service right because you know am I allowed to be open what policies do I need to have in place uh, how much spacing do I need how do I you know work with my employees and job keepers and job starts and all the rest of it right? and it just it just becomes like overwhelming for so many business owners and they're suddenly going oh hang on cci wa offers this thing and like you say it's not new you guys have always offered it it's mm -hmm. you know like the first aid thing for st john it's always been there but suddenly people are going i need to engage with this and uh, you know it's really good that you're both in organizations where the strategy hasn't had to change a lot it's just about making sure that people are aware and the message is getting out there mm -hmm. and and i guess to that point and i guess this is one of the biggest challenges um we've had and probably most marketers have is how have you changed your tone and your messaging right because it's it's still it's definitely not marketing as usual from that perspective um you know we're all very aware we're all reading books and blogs and all the rest of it about what people are open to and what they're not open to right so how have you both changed your your, your strategy around messaging and tone and brand purpose and all that sort of stuff well not brand purpose because we've covered that but Look, for, for me, um, I've, I've long been an advocate of storytelling and um, brand essence. As, as you mentioned, I started at Cadbury and yeah, that was a quarter of a century ago. <laughs> and um, the whole work um, load that we had back then, was it always came back to brand essence and your brand purpose and your strategic intent. So... Being, I've looked at some organisations, and I won't mention the brands, but um, I, I suppose it's it's easy for me to use that an example as an example because I've, I am an advocate of uh, telling your story and connection. I've seen some very very blatantly change their tone, and all of a sudden it's gone, you know, from buy this, buy this, buy this to hey, we're here for you, and you know, a nice little song <laughs> plays in the background, and and then they take advantage of cheap advertising and blast the heck out of it, <laughs> and, <laughs> and the consumer turns off. Mm. For us, it's been more: how can we? What what are our customers doing? What are our stakeholders doing? What do they want to hear? and what messages are important to them from St John. So it's not so much the tone, I think, that's changed. Um, Aaron's been on board since August last year and he's been working strategically to ensure that we have a consistent brand tone throughout the organisation. So that work has been flowing through and paying off that we already had some words surrounding community, we're in it together, the humanity side of things, and you know, we're, we're all, uh, we're still here. But from um, the actual delivery of it, we've really been looking at all, all of those channels of communication. And we are really blessed that we put a lot of effort into making sure that our digital platforms were strong 
before COVID hit. So when we needed to, and not all of them, we've, we've found some cracks in the wall that we know that we, we knew they were there and, um, but, but now all of a sudden they're, they're diabolically important. But it, it's looking at those challenges and asking the question of what do you want to hear from St John? and investing in the short, sharp research. It only costs five or $6,000. And I say that from a big organisation. I know that some of the people here are a lot smaller and that's a lot of money. But there are ways of reaching out to your customer base and asking, what do you want to hear from me at this time? Um, I've noticed that there's a curtain uh, manufacturer or provider in the list of people who might be here today or listen to it later. And, you know, I'm thinking that the type of things that their customers might be wanting to hear is not so much about what curtain that curtains they've got or what special offers they've got, but how safe they're going to be when that person comes into the home to measure up and install. So for me, it's yeah. about not so much changing the tone. It's about making sure that the message is relevant and that we're answering questions that are on the, in people's minds, either consciously or unconsciously. I've, um, I don't think we've changed our tone and I think, I think we are fairly clear about what kind of messaging and what kind of things our members want from us because like I said, we're touch base with them. Chris has been on the phone with members, um, with our, our CEO has been on the phone with members. He's very close to this. He's been great in kind of leading us and pulling us forward. I just, I'm mindful and it's a personal thing more than, than a, a, a than what's happening at CCI. I'm just mindful that we don't slip into that icky space where we are advertising and saying all those, you know, I, I'm, I'm in two minds. We have been around for a long time. We have, you know, always been about our members and our community and how it all works. We have already, you know, we've done all that. Um, but because those, and I'm talking about that mashup of, um, uh, of those big brands that kind of have put out their videos like the Uber and the, I'll say the brands, Claire, I don't mind. I'll say the brands, um, the Ubers and the <laughs> Maccas and the, do you know what I mean? Like those big guys, you know, out with advertising. Yeah. It feels kind of icky for to for them. I, I get why they're doing it. And, and I guess that's where the separation between me as a marketer and me as a, somebody going through a crisis kind of blurs into into one thing because we all want messages of hope. We all want to be, you know, feeling like we're positive and be, you know, there's, there's something that's coming over the horizon that's going to be better. But just checking to make sure that that's a good, that's a good place for where your advertising tone hits, I think is really just, I'm just mindful of that. And so when I hear, there's lots of phrases that everybody's using and I'm just really cognizant that we're trying to put, you know, be clear about the fact that we stand for business and that, you know, we, we're here for members, that we're listening, like being, being honest and authentic as much as we can. And certainly all the work that um, our policy team are doing, um, our economics team are doing, um, Chris himself, like they're all living and breathing the brand. And so I don't really, I'm, I'm comfortable that we're not necessarily putting anything out. It's just when we come to the formal pieces, just making sure that we're not smushing it into that icky territory and, you know, talking about it that's not really authentic. Yeah, and it, it's it's easy to do, right? Because so much of the marketing that came out was COVID nineteen stuff, and like we're not. I mean, like we were talking about this the other day, Sam. It's we're not all community messaging organisations. You know, the, the example that I shared was even with us as Bonfire, right? So we've got our billboard that you know sits on Hay and Loftus Street, and obviously we needed to adapt our messaging to be at least sensitive to the times, right? You, like you say, you can't keep beating the drum the way you have traditionally. And <clears throat> the inner marketer in me, our, uh, our friends at Meerkats who do our creative, um, came up with this fantastic billboard. It's just going to be a black billboard with just a hashtag, which was stay home. And I went, oh my God, that would be amazing because people would be so shocked by it and it'll have so much cut through. And just before I went live, I checked myself, ourselves, um, and kind of went, well, hang on, but we're not, a community organization fundamentally we're still a digital agency and our our true purpose is to help businesses grow and while that's a really nice community message for us to put up there are we going back into icky territory and just trying to be like everybody else or are we trying to be sensitive to what's going on but do it in a way that is still contextually relevant for us as an organization and for our audience right and so obviously we went with um, isolate yourself and not your business, which still talks to the fact that, look, we're here, we can help you with your business, 
but we are very aware that the important thing right now is we as a community need to do something. And that's, that is the tricky thing that, I, you know, the mashup's probably a prime example of where it is very easy to fall back into this. Um, we're going to be wonderful and we're here for you, um, even though we sell, I don't know, toilet cleaner or something. So anyway, but I digress. Um, okay. We've got five minutes left on this webinar and I, I knew pretty much from the outset that the three of us really do like to talk quite a bit. So we're, we're, we're running very thin. I'm just going to do a quick check and see if we've had any questions um, from the audience. Um, okay, so we've had one question. This is for you, Sam. Uh, communication would have been quite challenging for you at this time. Have you found increased pressure from your client base looking for guidance, direction and support? And if so, what trends have you seen and what they're looking for? Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of it, uh, a lot of it has been, so yeah, we, we get a lot of our insights from our employee relations call centre because they're the guys on the front line yeah. for us. So members are calling in and, and I know during the peak we were taking something, you know, for a, for an organisation our size, you know, we were hitting, you know, somewhere between 80 to, you know, maybe 100 calls a day, which is quite heavy for us. Um, yeah. And really it's about navigating those things that you were talking about. Um, it's about what am I allowed to claim? What am I, you know, how do I help my people? You know, how, you know, all of that stuff. It's been about reacting to the situation more than anything. Um, but now as we kind of are coming out of that and people that are businesses are starting to like look into um, the future, it's really about making sure that we're all set, right? That we're all looking at it, not just, you know, it's not, it's not going to be a, a switch that we can just flip and all of a sudden it's back to normal. Yeah. We're going to have to figure out how we kind of lead everyone through that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of practical advice and a lot of hands-on, um, you know, you know, we've got we've got a we've got an organisation with some really great HR and ER and um, you know workplace relations people, and so just just relying on them for our members out, but also relying on it for ourselves as well. Like that's why we've had such a great experience and we've been able to navigate yeah. through this because we have all this great experience inside the business. Um, did I answer that question, um, or did I just ramble on about stuff? Well, I, I think so. I mean, fun, fundamentally, this. Yeah. The thing is, you've always had this information, this content yeah. available to people, right? So they're just probably leaning on the stuff, as I mentioned a bit earlier, where they're suddenly going, oh, these are all the things that I've kind of taken for granted and not one wanted to worry about. Um, and obviously, you're practicing what you're preaching, using your own resources to yeah. navigate your own way through it. Yeah, right. um, and Claire, from your point of view, I mean, we were, we were chatting the other day as well, and there's probably been a, a bit of a shift in terms of some of your offerings around what people need. And you were talking to me about the the telehealth side of things. So maybe you can kind of share how that's found its own little groove in light of what's going on. Yeah, te telehealth is already, um, it was already around and we yep. we had it up in Calbalda. It, uh, all of us, so, so we were very lucky that we already had the model there that we were able to then very quickly push it out to the rest of the um, urgent care and dental and health centres and, and adapt. But a lot comes with that. So the, the operations marketing team were doing things from having to change on hold messaging. Our phone systems, could they cope now? Because obviously telehealth is by, by its very nature is reliant on people either booking online or making a phone call in order to secure that booking for someone to ring them back. Were the GPs ready for telehealth? Um, and so there, how do we communicate that to people? What, what were people's appetites for telehealth? I actually had a telehealth appointment and was surprised that I still felt consulted with, even though I'm talking to the doctor on a telephone and he couldn't do all the normal symptomatic testing that he normally would do. So how do we communicate to people in, in a way that we can bring that technology into their lounge rooms and um, kitchens and make them feel comfortable with it quickly that that was such a challenge getting that done um, in a, a very a very simple product that appears complex in people's minds where we know that there would be a version to it and, and remarkably males and uh, unremarkably people under the age of thirty five have been the most um, have been had the biggest uptake of telehealth. Oh, wow. Yeah, right. Well, I had my first telehealth experience, so I'm probably testament to that. Um, and maybe on that note, we'll, we'll, um, we'll draw this to a close because it is 11.30. Um, uh, if there's any other questions that people have got, um, if you don't mind, Claire and Sam, I'll share them with you and then we can maybe 
um, share them through a blog article or something after the fact. But um, I just want to thank you both very much uh, for your time today. Um, both your organisations have done a, a remarkable job through what this phase of COVID-19. I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. So um, best of luck, luck navigating through the rest of it. Um, and on that note, um, enjoy the rest of your day. No worries. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, and that's the end of the webinar. Thanks for having us. All right. Bye. Thanks, bye.